Hey, welcome to The Ordinary Black Professionals. I'm Nicole. And I'm Stefan. And this episode, we wanted to dedicate it and talk a little bit about the Black Lives Matter movement and how it's affected us personally and also affected us at work. This year has been the strangest year, the most unusual year ever. Mm. We have lived through a global pandemic. We're still living through it. We're still going through lockdowns. And we hope to keep living through it. Uh, yeah, and we ho- exactly. We hope to keep living through it. And we have all been heavily impacted by the murder of George Floyd, whether it's been personally or, or in our work lives. And we just wanted to use this episode today to, to talk about that. Mm. So we wanted to open it up and start the conversation talking about how we have personally been affected by George Floyd's murder and the follow on Black Lives Matter protests that have been happening all around the world. So for me personally, it has felt all consuming, uh, especially kind of, you know, when the protests just started happening, social media was popping every day on the social, something was going on, some social media post was trending and it was, it was just too much. I couldn't, I couldn't take it to be on the socials and looking at it every day, talking about it at work with colleagues outside of work seeing it on the news it was just triggering it was too sad to consume all of that at once whilst also kind of living through a global pandemic as well Mm. yeah I think the George Floyd moment was just absolutely terrible um as well it was very overwhelming you know as a black man when you see things like that I've seen so many videos of this happening in America and in the UK Mm. of police brutality um, that is starting to become desensitizing now. Mm. And um, when you see something like that, it really triggers you because you know, as a black man, that, you know, something like that, there's things that are going on right now in our society that we live in right here that that could be me. You know, yeah. and um, it's hard to watch. I've got to a point now where you know I, I'm not even in, interested in watching them anymore. No, I can't watch those videos. Mm. I just can't watch it. I don't think I have never even watched the full video of the George mm. George Floyd murder. Yeah, I, I've watched it. Um, and yeah, it's hard at the time of recording now of this episode. We are. You know, a few months. It's been a few months since that moment. Yeah, happened. we're towards the end of the year. Yeah, and um, and and now we're sort of reflecting on that, and and reflecting on what was the outcome of all this stuff, mm. right? We know that the Black Lives Matter movement itself, or the uh, organization in the uh, U.S., was primarily built first on it was primarily built first on uh, police brutality. And the police brutality movement that they were trying to stop, you know, it just it just keeps continuing. And, and we feel the fallout of that here because it hits us because there are so many statistics of the things that happen to black men and women in this country, the you know the the easy one that everybody points to is stop and search. Yeah, it's just it's just a blatant discrimination of who are you looking at? Who do you think is a potentially you know dangerous dangerous here person for me to stop and search? Yeah, or not even dangerous. I just want to stop, stop and, and search, search you. you. I mean, and... just to kind of throughout this episode, we're going to be dropping down you know, certain facts for people and. Just to lay one on you right from the get-go, black people are 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched compared to their, in the UK, compared to their white counterparts. Mm. Um, I think we all know someone who has been stopped and searched, either when they've been on foot or when they've been driving their car. My brother, for example, has been stopped and searched when he's been in his school uniform. School uniform? In his school uniform, five minutes away from his house 
So it was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And so we all we all have stories like that. Um of where it's you know we've been personally affected or we know someone else who has and I think the the killing the murder of George Floyd has sparked such a sparked a flame inside people to really stand up and call out injustices and just be really vocal about what's going on in the black community in the UK in the US and, and elsewhere. Just across the world. Just across, this just across the world. Across the world. Yeah. yeah, just across the world. And it's really, I think, it's really been a call for action, mm. not just for individuals, black or otherwise, you know, our allies, but also for companies as well. Loads of organisations as a result of the Black Lives Matter protests have stood up, taken action and have actively tried to do something in the right direction whether whether these were good steps in the right direction or not I think we're going to come and talk about that a bit later but there's been some kind of change in the way they're acting to be able to show that they are um, an ally for the black community Hmm. so yeah so the the, this is born on police brutality right but this spark that you say is caused is now overflowing into black people really voicing how we feel in all sorts of other 100%. situations in our life right yeah. and and I... that has now spilled over to um you know even the workplace yeah and yeah. how um companies are now having to respond to 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 black people vocally saying how we are treated we are treated in these places and we're not viewed as being equal yeah. Regardless of how you want to spin it, how you want to play it, what you, anyone wants to say, statist- statistically, black people are not given the same opportunities in the workplace, we're not promoted in the same ways as, as our white, white counterparts, and we are not considered to be equal to our white counterparts in the workplace. And stats show and prove that time and time and time again. And it's not just the workplace where we're not viewed as being equal. It's places like the NHS as well. You know, black women are five times more likely to die from childbirth or complications as a result of childbirth than their white counterparts. Can someone please explain that? Why? Why is that? If that's not a result yeah. of racism and discrimination, I honestly don't know what is. Right. And, and that shocking is that statistic if you're not shocked by that then there's something wrong yeah if that doesn't make you feel sick there's something wrong and discrimination racism isn't always blatant in your face and you know throughout my whole of my life i faced it too right but it's not always someone calling you the n-word yeah the n-word in your face or a monkey or or go back to your home country or or any of that stuff which does happen on a regular basis but (laughs) we'll leave that to the side for now but it's also the subtleness, mm. especially in the UK, because we are the best at subtle, just subtle digs, discrimination. Yeah. We're the best at it. British right. people don't like to be, <laughs> we don't, we're not in your face, are we? We like to be a bit more, yeah. <laughs> sneaky, bit more sly, back, sneaky you know? about it. So um, when it comes to the workplace and dealing with that kind of attitude as well, in the workplace the sneaky digs behind your back and 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 things that people are saying the ideas that people are planting in other people's heads the simple simple thing is you're difficult to work with you know something someone could just say that and it's now become a fact yeah despite someone not proving that fact yeah it's now become a fact now you're difficult to work with now you're not getting any promotions I agree, and... agree. Or you're really aggressive. Right. And there's a definition for all those terms, those subtle things that happen in the workplace that you can't you can't exactly call it racism, but there's something's not quite right and you, you maybe don't know the language for it. But the word for those in my, things in my opinion is racism, full stop. Well the well the word for those things are microaggressions. Yeah. So they're indirect often unintentional expressions of racism that come out as seemingly unintentional or intentional well i i think sometimes when people say things they're not putting the dots together so they just mm. come out and be like oh you're aggressive to a black woman but, but they not don't know understand where they got that from. exactly 
Right. Exactly. So you're not, they're not thinking of, well, where am I getting that connotation from that a black woman's angry? It's kind of, it's kind of like when you call a woman bossy. Mm. You need to understand why the use of that word bossy mm. is completely is unacceptable. Assertive. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And a man just assertive. So sometimes these are these seemingly harmless, quote unquote, harmless comments um, that, that come out from people that can sometimes be quite well-intentioned. Um, so some of those kind of microaggressions that many of you have probably heard of before said to yourself or said to a friend or know that has been said by somebody is, can I touch your hair? Is your hair real? Stop using the race card. I don't see colour when I look at you. What? Where are you originally from? Or he, he, here's my favourite, well, not my favourite, but here's one that I've heard mm. quite a few times. You speak really well. Oh, my God. How many times that. have oh. I had people say to me, Nicole, you speak really, really well. If I've ever spoken to somebody, <laughs> I'm like, if I've ever spoken hmm. to somebody on the phone, right, first, I, this always happens to me every time in my life. If I ever speak to somebody on the phone first and then meet them later in person. Oh, yeah, they're shocked. They are. They're, not only are they shocked, but they ask me. You, you say you sounded different on you the sound phone. sound different on the phone. It's the same voice coming out, you know. But, this is, but, but these, now I sound different because I look different. Exactly. Ah. These are these microaggressions. So they're coming out like they're well-intentioned. Like, oh, mm. I'm giving you a compliment. Mm. But what you really mean is you you sounded, you sound so well-spoken. <laughs> there is no way in my mind that I thought you were a black person. Mm. Because black people don't sound like you. Nope. Black people aren't articulate, aren't, aren't you know, don't, don't speak a certain type of way. Mm. And, and you know what? Which, Those exact words you said take me straight back to pictures of black people in segregation, in races, in, in, in slavery, things like that, because, oh, you can't even read and write yeah. and things like that. The expect- that that's, a, that's the picture it takes me back to when you say, what, why can't why, you expect me to be that? What, you cannot expect me to be able to talk like you? Yeah. Another one, another microaggression, which I've not heard, no one said this to me before, but I 100% have heard this said to other people is, your name is so unusual. Your name? Your name is so unusual. Your name is Nicole? Or, or your na- no, no, not to me. Oh. I'm saying I've heard this said to other people. Or your right. name is so exotic. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is basically saying your name ain't English. <laughs> Your or name, English yeah. sounding, but you don't say that to someone who is from Eastern Europe. I mean, if you, if you <laughs> like, give me a name, um, Ben, that's an exotic name. That's an exotic name to someone in Japan. You know what I mean? To someone in Africa, or not even in Africa, but somewhere else, somewhere, somewhere else, South Korea. Ben, ooh, ooh, that's exotic. Where are you from? Yeah, you know what I mean. How that's if someone if if they showed up in Korea or somewhere and they said my name's Ben and they said that's exotic. They'll be like, excuse me? <laughs> totally <So>. agree. <laughs> and that's and that's what I think this like the Black Lives Matter movement, this this buzz, this energy that's come from the the killing of the murdering of, of George Floyd, is that companies are much more aware, as you said, as how black people, their black employees are not valued in the same way and how they're discriminated against. And those these microaggressions as well, and I and I honestly don't think that I think companies were aware of it. I think most companies have a DNI function in some way, shape, or form. I don't think that they were actively trying to engage with their black employees mm. and trying to make their experience better and trying to help them elevate and break the ceilings so they can hit those C-suite positions. Mm. They weren't doing that before. The Black Lives Matter buzz that was that started happening uh-huh. kind of earlier this year, it just wasn't happening. I've n- I've not seen as much emphasis placed in that in the DNI realm as I'm seeing right now. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure that companies are really, have really changed what they're doing in DNI. Well, I I don't Maybe think there, I there think some companies some are giving lip service. <laughs> I think, I think most acting of them like they've changed service, whether they've actively yeah. done something but I also a... think Sorry. it's not even the, the case of them uh, whether they're actively doing something or not, they first have to understand what the problem is mm. right? and I think most of them don't understand the problem because 
the, the microaggressions that we talked about, a lot of people either don't see that as a problem, mm. you know, or they just don't understand it. Mm. Agree. There has to come the I, I think companies have to do a few things. They have to talk to their black employees and be open to hearing criticism. So, so you need to be at a place where you're kind of humble, humble first to mm. be able to be receptive to that information. And I know that there have been a few companies where um, where they've kind of done little mini focus groups with black employees to really understand what the struggles is. What what do you want to see more of? More of how can we be better as an organisation? Mm. And I think until that's done and know management or whatever companies are open to hearing that criticism and making a change things won't happen and then once you're open to hearing a change that educational piece needs to happen you know there should be people need to understand black people included exactly what a microaggression is and feel comfortable to a certain extent calling that out no one in the workplace should be asking if I can touch a black person's hair or anyone's hair anyone's hair it's just weird. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not an animal that you pet at a zoo. Like, it's just so strange to even feel comfortable enough Go to, to ask that question. And touch it in the packet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like you're so different, you're so other, that I must somehow touch that other differentness. Mm. It's the weirdest thing. And how many people have asked me, can I touch their hair? I could count on it. I'll, I couldn't even count on my hand. It's been so many. Mm. Or people who just go in to touch my hair without even asking has Damn happened yeah. to me before <laughs> it's just bizarre and that is a common story for all black women yeah. and men you know some men mm. as well men like, who have like afros or like yeah. really long hair or dreads yeah or yeah. even bald, bald head they just want to touch your head like b- touch your bald head weird men go through, go through that too so yeah i mean black lives matter movement is a good thing um and out of it has come an outpouring of of pain and hurt and and uh, feeling that is affecting businesses, right? Um, and they're starting to hear how black people feel in the workplace, right? And even before, even before this movement, since the George, this movement's going been going on for years, by the way. But yeah, since yeah. the George Floyd moment. Um, even before then, like they did have DNI, right? And they were doing things in DNI. Some of these companies, right? I hope, I hope most of them. I, but, I hope, I hope. But some but of these companies I... were doing things, and they were actively trying to hire more, uh, di- more, more black more talent, diverse people. Yeah, but they were doing it sometimes not even with the right intentions. Yeah. Right. Just and, oh, go ahead. Yeah. J- just to stop there. Um, I think as well when we think of like so I'm I'm the DNI lead, diversity inclusion lead at my company so this is a topic or diversity inclusion is something that I'm extremely passionate about and absolutely love speaking about but when we think of hiring diversely we always have to remember it's like that's diverse in every sense of the word uh-huh. so there's no point hiring you know loads of people who are black if they're all private school educated middle class you need to make sure you hire people who come from different ethnicities you know people who have disabilities people from different class you know social social economic uh, status is massive is massive yeah. is massive massive because class being working or middle up or whatever that dictates so much of your experience of life yeah and it dictates so many opportunities that you can and cannot have all down to you know your your economic status right and 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 when i say they're not doing the right right intentions you know sometimes they they do have maybe the right intentions but they go about it the wrong way and mm. i think one of the things that they go about the wrong way is this thing bame b a m e right i absolutely i do not like this thing at all black asian and minority ethnic so I don't like it because it puts all this massive group of people in a one box, yeah. right? So when you hire, now you've got two boxes you hire. You've got English or British slash white, that you the person you expect to look a certain way, 
and then you got Bain, right? But and Bain, comp- the the thing with Bain is that the the title is too, as you said, it's too broad. Right. You can't just you can't just lump all Bain people together because there's so many differences that live within that. Yeah. Cultural differences, nuances, even even just by using the word black, mm. even underneath that umbrella term. We're you know, not you've all got the same. yeah, you've got black African, you've got black Caribbean, and then underneath that, you've got so many. You've yeah. got black Jamaican, you've got black Bajan, you've got black black St. Kitts, so on St. Lucia. It's just so diverse yeah. that even just, to, so, you you know, if you struggle to even group black together, how could on earth could you group, have, can you group BAME, mm. black and Asian and ethnic minorities? Like, And you know what? They wouldn't do the same for their minority groups, right? So their minority groups would be like, you've got white Irish. English and you've got white Irish and you've got white Scottish and then you've got like, let's say Norwegian right cultures are completely different and those wouldn't just they wouldn't mix the same way Mm. and 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 obviously people are people people can get along and mix and things like that but there's so much cultural difference that it's a good thing if you have a mixture of these people it's a good thing for your company it's a good thing for the culture of the company to say we've got such a mixture of people we've got a mixture of thought you know of diversity through the business, different people, different backgrounds to give us an even understanding and even languages and things mm. like that. And you have to remember that people from different backgrounds, backgrounds, they just bring different elements and perspectives and opinions and ways of thinking to the table. That if you have a company which is very homogenous and thought, that's exactly what you're going to get out. You're not going to get different ideas. You're not going to get innovative thinking because everyone thinks the same. And there's no one to challenge any particular viewpoint because everyone thinks the exact same way. So you need to have that that diversity there. I think... Um, but you also need to have a bit of... I believe you need to have a bit of quantity and diversity because it's no good me being the only black guy. Well, this, well, this is another thing I was going to ask. You know, we're talking about this this kind of uh, where companies aware of um, discrimination and the black experience before the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, what is, just give a little bit about your experience of being black and in the workplace. Yeah, I mean. Do you work for a company that you are one of many or are you quite, I've always are you, are you very much companies. working in, in predominantly white spaces? Yeah, I've always worked in companies where I'm one of the few. Most of the time, in like a lot of my past work in companies and stuff like that, I've been one of the, what, two or three, or maybe the only one black person mm. in on the whole project that I'm working on. And um, it's not a great experience. It's experience that kind of silences you because um, your diversity of thought and your diversity of uh, of approach, even the way that you communicate might be slightly different. Um, there are people who are black, but they are from, you know, maybe a Nigerian background or Ghanaian background, something like that. And they communicate in different ways, right? And the way in which you communicate is not understood or or they think you communicate weird, right? They just think what because you... you're black. No, no, because the, of your cultural background, you communicate a different way, right? Let's say you're Nigerian or something like that. So you communicate. But what a about your way. experience? My yeah, my personal experience is is, is the same thing, right? So I'm you're just saying... giving an example of of you communicate in a different way, and then that's not being conveyed properly. That's not coming across. That's not understood by the other people on the project. So you're saying the way you come across the people isn't always understood to other people who are not of the same ethnicity on the project. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, And so, you know, that happens on on projects. You're also the only, you're you're the only one bound and stuff like that. So, you know, the Bantu is different things like that. I didn't grow up in these with people that may be um, in an environment where they are from an upper class background. I didn't grow up the same way they did so the way they communicate in their banter and what their understanding of how to create a bond between the, the, 
their friends and stuff like that is different to how I created bonds with my friends in my class. Yeah. You know? So um, it's, it's, it's a bit isolating when you're the only person there, right? So my experience was to always just, you know, let me just focus on my work. Let me just focus on what I know how to do, and that's do good work mm. and stuff like that. So I may, I always made that my goal, my most important thing to do. And um, in some ways, it kind of worked out, but um, it wasn't always like comfortable experiences yeah. or or enjoyable or stuff yeah. like that. And there are times when you think to yourself what am I doing here? Yeah. <laughs> it's time. I've, I need to leave this place. Yeah. I've definitely felt that way. Me, I agree. You know, it's, I think what, so when I was in the bigger company, I was always around someone who maybe not was someone who was black, but someone who was, you know, an, an ethnic minority group. So I never felt like I was the only one on the project. Moving into a smaller company now, there's a handful of black people in the company. So I'm in a predominantly all white space all day, every day. And I completely echo everything he said. It's it's hard. You know, there's sometimes when you when you leave and you think, Maybe I'm not meant to be here. Mm. Maybe this is isn't for me. Because you it's exactly what you said, you know, you're in I, I my per you know, me personally, I grew up in Northwest London around a very mixed group of people, blacks, Asians, whites, and I'm used to interacting with people who have been brought up in the same way as me, who have the same music interests as me, yeah. who has similar terms of reference as me, who just, you know, get how I speak and we all are on the same equal playing field. But when I go when I go into me. work, yeah, the terms of reference just isn't there. For I, example, yeah. I went into work speaking about power. Yeah, the TV and no show. And yeah. no one knows what power is. Exactly. Or, or I grew up watching <laughs> Sister, Sister. Sister. You know, People in my workplace don't know what Sister Sister they've is. They've never seen it. <laughs> and so even when you're trying to create a bond with people at work you can't create that no. because they have no reference you've got nothing to nothing. talk about they've gone fishing and you've never even done that yeah. and they've gone skiing and you've never, never done, that. done that so the and... terms of reference are not are wildly different if I was to go into work and say oh well, I went to go see Burner Boy in concert they'd be like who's What's that Boy? Yeah. and this is no exaggeration it would literally be who's Burner Boy <laughs> <laughs> I don't know no black person yeah. who, doesn't, who doesn't know who Burner Boy is <laughs> so it's it is really really hard um, and, and and when you're you know when you're the, the diversity and inclusion lead you know it's hard as well because you kind of sometimes I'll think to myself oh, well, I'm, you know, am I in this role because I'm a bit of a token and that that thought has come come to my mind as well, but I have to remind myself, you know, the skills that I bring to the table and the fact that I am incredibly passionate about diversity and inclusion, and that is why I head up the function and the team to make sure that we have, you know, diversity and inclusion is woven into all the the, the decision making and the processes in the business. But has, but you know, it's hard. Can I say that every day it's easy being in all white spaces? No, that would be an absolute lie. Mm. Um, and as, as you think, we both said that the terms of reference is by far the the hardest thing. And having someone that you feel like you can gel with. So I'll give an example. When I was in my old company, in the, the, this big company, I used to work for a big FS bank um, or a big bank. And... Every day when I used to go up to the lifts to go onto my particular floor, I would bump across a few black people. I, they were the client. <laughs> I have no idea to this day exactly what they did. Yeah. And we would always say hi to each other and smile. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a man, an older man and a few other women. And sometimes me and the man would have a few conversations and stuff like, oh, how was your weekend? Yeah. I have there was no reason for us to, us to speak. He started smiling and saying hi to me. And the only reason we spoke is because we were both black. Mm. 
there was a commonality there. Yeah. And the same thing happened when we was on our honeymoon last year. We was in Vietnam. And we were walking, you know, in one direction. We saw a black oh, yes. couple working, walking, to, walking towards us in the opposite direction. I think they and were we, American. at the same time, just said hi to each other. I know. <laughs> <laughs> if they were a white couple, we wouldn't have said hi. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but they were like... And we didn't see any black people out there. We didn't so. see any. They were the only ones. Yeah. And they, they, we were the only black people they'd seen. Yeah. So we were like... <laughs> And the fact that we both said it at the same time. I think they were probably American or something. I don't know where, I don't they, were know where they were from. But it was a high, we waved, there's acknowledgement, and we carried on walking. And it's that commonality that you get where you're like, I'm not alone. There's someone else here. I yeah. deserve to be here. Yeah. Where, you know, you feel like you're valued. So, so that's why I talk about, yeah, we need diversity. We need fame and lots of different people in different categories. But we need... Um, inclusion. Yeah, we need inclusion, well, but we also need the numbers. As I said, it's no good if you're the only one. We need, need um, numbers. The, the, you know, the, the numbers of people in those groups, so we can form communities, and so exactly. because that's how it works in society, right? In realistic society, there's there's Indian and Pakistani and Caribbean, Jamaican societies, right? And and we come together, we do our thing. Because it's part of our culture, mm. right? And it doesn't mean that you're not part of the wider society. That's right. It just means this is this is a group where you have communities. commonalities, where sure. you're, yeah, where you said you're, you're a community. I was saying societies, communities, yeah. But the thing is, is that to get those numbers in, especially for smaller companies, can sometimes be harder than you think it is. Maybe it because is. Because if you're, sm- if you're smaller, believe... you have a smaller reach and a smaller budget. And in the UK, you so you can't you if you have a black and a white candidate, yeah. and they're both going for the same job, it's illegal for a company to just give that per in the UK to just give that person a job because they're black. You cannot do that. That's illegal. Yes, but it, it, but you can fine. specifically go to recruitment agencies that hire diversely and put your job in that. Um, in that company so there are companies out there but there's that also are specifically companies. looking at how do we get black consultants or black individuals into consultancy you can yeah. put your post in you can advertise a job in that recruitment company but don't forget as well like maybe it may be difficult but you can also look for class and that diversity in class will help as well because it gives you a different diversity of thought. Somebody who grew up in a, a, a lower bracket of class will have grown up with maybe more diverse people around them and I, will later on down the line will be recommended to that company a diverse, you know, someone from another background. Candidate. Or... I agree. But then, see, then this is, so this is the sort of stuff that I am have lots of conversations with recruitment about. And it's tricky because how do you find these people from working class backgrounds? There's not a website where people sign up and go, <laughs> I'm working class, yeah, give me a job. I, I do feel like a so lot of companies... So you have to find other routes to get in. A lot of companies, though, like, they are very... They only hire from certain places. They only want to hire from Oxbridge. They only want to hire from... Um, Russell Group, Russell Red, Group. Vic, Red you, Brick. You know what I mean? And, and that's... That's the first point of call. Yeah. If you're if you're looking for the the the, the bottom layer, the the grads, the the young people first coming in, right? Who's going to build your company later in the future? And then and then you go straight on looking for only Oxbridge and and Russell Group. Then you're, you're high... obviously looking for a class. Yeah. Right. Well, and... do you know you're not necessarily you're looking for a class. You are looking for a certain type of candidate, but. The people who go to Oxbridge or go to those t- red brick universities are disproportionately from yes. middle class backgrounds and therefore upper, middle and upper class, middle yeah. upper class and therefore end up being private school or boarding school educated. Yes. So it all has a knock on effect because the moment you can send your child to a private or boarding school, you're you have so much surplus income that you are just automatically work uh, middle class. Mm. Um, it's it's being clever. Companies need to be clever about the way that they hire talent and look at different ways that they can try to hire um, diversely. 
But what's so important that companies do is they take stock of what they currently have in their company. All organizations should be capturing and um, monitoring data so they know who they have in their company so they can start benchmarking and working out are they you know, how far do they need to go to have a truly diverse organization are they ticking all the all the um all the boxes or do they have a little bit of way to go so a good bit of research needs to be done in internally how many people how many different ethnicities do they have in the company how many people regard themselves to be male gender non-binary you should be collecting all that information you know what sometimes and that that's the that's the job of the hr and then once you have that information then you can kind of do some research and understand okay so in london we may have you know whatever numbers it is however many numbers and people in different senior positions how does that benchmark to other organizations of a similar size in london because if you do the maths and you work out that you've only got you know, you've got no senior women in c-suite positions but you benchmark and you realize well, actually loads of companies of a similar size have five to ten senior women in senior positions then you know that your company is not diverse and, and, it, and it's falling behind as an employee sometimes you need to opt into that information and i think people should do that like uh, my company they have a form where you put in you know, your next of kin and mm. all that stuff right and also it says oh what ethnic background are you from and by default it says um you, you've not answered or yeah or none, prefer if you can have options, or pref- like, yeah or i prefer, prefer not, not to, to say, say right? or something but i put my ethnic background in there mm. because I want it to be recorded because I want them to understand how much of them are, we are. So they've got the data and, and if they want to make a real change, they can make a real change, mm. right? They, or they can move in that direction. Um, without that data, they won't even know what's going on yeah. in the company. Sometimes, sometimes we need to opt into that. I agree. I agree. But the companies also need to give you a choice. So the moment you become an employee for that company, they should have they should be giving you a form that where you fill in that monitoring data. Mm. And if they're not, that's a problem. And that data should include your ethnic diversity, the sexuality that you define yourself as or you identify as and also your gender. And it should have the options of of male, female, non-binary, prefer not to say. Like you should see all the different kind of options of ethnicities, genders, sexualities on there. And if you realize that they only say lesbian and gay, but they're missing all the others, you know, bisexual, um, pansexual, um, asexual, whatever it is, then that's <laughs> that's a problem because I'm not being represented in the data. Yeah. How how on earth can you how on earth can you you represent me and and be able to know whether you need to hire you know different types of people if you don't have that data, and then most importantly when you have got that diverse company making a company that feels inclusive, I think a lot of the time what happens with black people is they go to these companies, big or small or whatever, and they don't feel like they what we both said don't feel like they belong, the culture is not represent like there's a company culture that but we don't see ourselves in it we're not represented in it oh, there's yeah. a there's a there's a banter that we're not represented in it because right. no one's thought about us at all and so you need to make a place where people feel comfortable and feel like they're included in mm. the company that's a I big think a one. lot of the time black people are very much isolated from it sometimes when i'm looking for companies or something like that um recruiters say they've got a fantastic company culture right i look at it i look at the website the company and culture does not include me no it what that company culture can be especially in the it industry right can be pool tables um drinks beers on fridays a, a colorful uh, open plan work space all that stuff right mm. and people that will talk to you all throughout the day but your website does not include anyone that looks like me yeah uh, you've got lots of pictures on your website, but not a single one that looks like me. Yeah. And that's so important. If you, it says that maybe a bit controversial here, but if you look, if you're putting up pictures where everyone in the company is white. Mm. I won't be applying there. I, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I When I was looking for a job, if I'm researching and you haven't, 
you've got this website and you haven't even bothered to think about diversity getting people that aren't just women in the singing position you're not yeah. thinking about any other types of diversity and you are more than comfortable to put up a picture of all white people in the company and not show one person of you know one ethnic minority individual mm. why would i want to work there could you clearly don't think about me yep. <laughs> yep. and there's such an um a, a, a quote that i use all the time at work and i can't remember where it originated from but the quote is that you need to be um asked to the dance so therefore kind of invited into the company and then invited to dance so that means you need to be in once you get to the party you then need to be included in all the festive all the festivities and included in that dance you'd be asked them so you're participated in it right. and you know, I think that's just so important for organizations to really think about how am I including black people in that company and in that culture. And it's funny what you say about going for drinks. Now, don't get it twisted. Black people will go to the pub and they'll go to drink. I'm not saying that all black people don't go to the pub. However, what I am saying is whenever I've gone to the pub, I've never once seen a group of a group of black, predominantly black people in the pub. I see the odd black person with white friends or colleagues at mm. the pub. I wouldn't say that the pub is where black people go to socialize. No, so when you have how, companies be like, oh, play. it's not really, it's not, it's not really what I wouldn't yeah. say again, I mean, massive there generalization. Will be, yeah, there, there will, will be, be don't come for us because there will be people, black people who do go for, to the pub. Yeah. I ain't saying that. I'm saying just as a generic statement from what I've seen, I don't see groups of all black people going to the pub. It's not our scene. It's not. So, so, so when people go, oh, we go to the pub every Thursday to get a beer. Okay, that's great. You just put a negative on your company right there. I'm not interested. It's just not inclusive. <laughs> it's just not. It's just not inclusive. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, yeah, they they're telling me as if that's a positive thing. Like, oh yeah, every Thursday we go to the pub. We have a great time. That's a as you. I've just marked that as a negative. It's like, like it's against like this company. I'm not even interested. It's like us being like, oh, so every Thursday we go to an Afro Beats bar. It's, it's that kind of it's that kind of yeah, thing yeah, and we yeah. listen to burner boy yeah yeah yeah. who's burner boy though no that was the good enough that will be good every first day <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i think it can be challenging and and you know loads of companies have tried to you know in the wake of the black lives matter movement protest and all that stuff have tried to make a step in the right direction whether it's a genuine one or not, I don't know. There's been a lot of posts, either public or privately in companies, talking about how they are allies to the movement and you know how they want to try to uplift and empower black employees a little bit more. And then just to put this into perspective, because we're talking a lot about you know how there's not a lot of black people who make up those C-suite positions. So to drop another fact fact bomb on everyone so out of the big four audit and advisory companies there's 3000 uk partners and 11 of those are black 3000 3000 uk partners and so these are like mds people. yeah 11 3000 is black what's that 11 1%? people are black is that less than 1% what is that i don't even know i don't know i wait hold on let me work out the percentage right now 0.36 percent 0.36 that is ridiculous absolutely ridiculous absolutely ridiculous there are that only... says it all because you know what I've, one thing i noticed throughout my career when i first started work it was like lots of white people you know i was used to that also the culture was different you know the work culture was like we had to wear suits every day to work as time went on, the culture changed. We're not wearing suits anymore. We're wearing jeans and a shirt, right? And as the work changed, they were doing a bit more DNI and a bit more black people were being hired, which I noticed. But it was always at the most junior levels, right? I never saw a change in the senior levels. I agree. Never. Because I don't, I don't know the reason why. It's not because of talent. It's not because black people don't have talent. <laughs> If someone's telling anyone that, that's an absolute lie. It's not true. 
but I, but well, I do know why. But there's there's lots of like racism going on there, bias going on there as to why people don't get promoted into those senior positions. There's also people picking their friends. Exactly. And do you want? Do you know what it is? Ultimately, you pick, you employ people who you feel connection with, who you feel like you remind me of me. Yeah. Or you have that bond with. If you're a black woman, I'm going. I'm just going to use myself. If I'm a black woman walking into a position now, and I'm being interviewed by a black older man, mm. you know he may have the nice of intention. Ultimately, he won't see. He, when he looks at me, he doesn't see himself in me. That's right. He just. He and, just. He just and... wouldn't. In the same way, I wouldn't see myself in him. I've, I've seen we've got two different so times. perspectives I've and seen, life experiences. I've seen managers that always take a guy under their wing, right? And they take that guy under their wing and that guy always gets the best in the projects and blah, blah, blah. But that guy is the perfect guy that reminds him of him when he was 20-something. Yeah. And, and, and then I'm there. Maybe I've got more talent. Maybe I'm kicking everything out of the park and stuff like that. But I won't be the one who takes under the wing and gives opportunities to. It will only be that guy. Yeah. You know, and um, and and until the landscape of who is in senior positions changes, it will always be that way. I don't know how to change that landscape without those senior people actually making a change themselves. I think it can it's, only come through them. It's them making a change themselves and being yeah. aware of their biases which is considering will, these will people, take right? time because well, considering you... these people are in their 40s 50s and 60s right they have to change their mindset of what they've been doing for a long time yeah and, and, and it's different. but i'm not just i don't want to say that all everyone out there has that mindset or yeah, you no. know, I've been given opportunities. moves around with biases and they're totally unaware and they're just living in a land of like clouds and dreams and cookie That's land right. i've met people who are white older men mm. or, or women or whatever it is who are very much allies and for the cause and, and also, are very much aware of their privilege and their advantage and oh even if they're not everything. aware even if they're not aware because let's be fair let's be real some of them are not quite aware of you know the things that we're talking about today right mm-hmm. but they still gave us an opportunity they still didn't put anything on them to say oh you remind me when i was 20 they didn't do all that they just said you're doing well i'm going to give you an opportunity and that's yeah. all they needed it's all they needed but if you have an if they someone gives you an opportunity as you know a junior grad out of uni you then need someone all throughout your career to give you those opportunities to be able to get into those managerial, yeah. senior manager, C suite positions. Give you that hand. Every Someone step needs of the to way. help you up, and if and if you don't have, if you don't have someone helping you as a black individual, it can be hard, mm. especially if you're in a company where you're in an all white space and there is no one black and senior in your company. If you're in a company and there's like three black people and the company has 150 or 200 employees, I mean, life is just, just is just going to be difficult for you because you, 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 there's no one there that looks for you that can advocate for you. There's no one there who is, who is in those positions already to say, yes, this can be done. And it's hard sometimes when you're in those positions to, to to not feel like you're being treated differently because you're black. Because I've got no other example in the company to see where black people are treated, you know, equally sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just say a story here? Well, not, not such a story, but something short. Since the George Floyd moment, um, companies have reacted my company that i work for has also reacted and um they've had some like sessions with the whole company everybody all the employees and they asked for personal stories from fame people um to explain the life that we live you know the the difference in our life Mm. and, and how you know the difficulties that we face and i remember they 
there were three black people that told their stories. Um, a lot of people are American, so like American-based people, a lot of them American-based stories, and, and some of them including police brutality or discrimination, something like that. Um, and there was also, there's one that stood out to me, it was not a black person, it was a Chinese person uh, or, or Chinese background. And um, And they said something that stood out to me, you know, they said, I'm not, I'm, I think they were mixed. Chinese and white. Oh no, sorry, not Chinese and white. I think they're Chinese, but born in America. Right. Right. Um, and they said, "I'm not quite Chinese enough to be accepted by my Chinese people because I'm American. I speak the language and stuff like that, but I'm still American, and they see me as American. But I'm not American enough to be American." Because they say I'm Chinese. Right. So it stood out to me because, yes, we hear this story all the time. You know, we're not, we, we're used to this because as black people, we kind of go through the same thing. I'm not British enough to be British, but y yeah. But it stood out to me because it was an opportunity as well for us to remember that there are other people going through discrimination, right? That not just black. It's not always black issues and things like that. These companies need to hire diverse, real diverse. Yeah. And there needs to be, you know, that Chinese person needs to have other people, Chinese people around them um, who understands their culture is in their spaces. And do they go to the pub? You know, do, do they, do you, do, when you go into the, China, uh, the pub, do you see that? people in, in groups and pub and, and stuff like that. Well, Where I'm, do they go? You yeah. know what I mean? What's, what's their scene? It's not our scene. What you said is sounded like a good scene, the Burner Boy Afrobeat thing. That sounds like a good scene. I'll go to that. <laughs> but, you know. Well, this is, yeah. And that's why I said, like, you know, diversity in all sense of the words, because it's not just getting more black people or whatever. It's people from different socioeconomic groups, people who have disabilities, people with different sexualities all of that stuff is is so so important um so yeah 100% agree I mean give an example you know when you go out to work at, you know drinks every Thursday for example what about the Muslim colleagues who don't drink mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so <laughs> it's we just need to be more mindful and, and sometimes it's the case that it's something that doesn't even cross your mind and you're completely oblivious to it. And, I, and I'm fully aware that because of my role as d and I lead, I'm very, I'm very aware and heightened to a lot of different stuff. So it comes to my mind and I'm, I'm aware that it comes to my mind a lot quicker because that's part of my job. But it is a responsibility and this is something that d and I leaders need to get across to their company and management need to get across to the company as well. That is everybody's responsibility to be thinking about this stuff and it's everybody's responsibility to be calling out when something just doesn't quite feel right in the dni spaces and for companies to put in place support routes for individuals if they need to escalate a particular thing that they've seen wrong or or or, or a colleague needs support in a particular area but ultimately everyone's responsible for calling out things that doesn't quite feel right mm. i've had experiences before where um, which happened, you know, quite recently where the client has commented on my physical appearance. Has that been my hair, my age, my height? Things that have been completely unacceptable. I've kind of said something to the client and kind of brushed it off a little bit. But ultimately, sometimes you don't always feel comfortable right there and there kind of squashing it or saying something and you need someone else to come in and and, and call out that behavior in a way it goes, oh, we don't comment on how anyone looks in this room. Because ultimately for anyone to be commenting on my age, my height or my hair, it's because they feel like they can do that and they wouldn't have commented on a white man's hair, height or age. I love that. Age. You know what? That's a whole nother point that I don't hear all the time in diversity and inclusion. And that is, diversity and inclusion is not just about hiring and having people put in senior positions. It's also about people 
who are, don't even, you know, your colleagues standing side by side with you. You yeah. both look different. You're both from two different backgrounds, but they stand up for you. But this is what I'm trying to say. You know? Some people don't... <laughs> It's kind of an educational piece yeah. because some people won't even clock it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I feel like but I think me, there's me some, things, me there's some in... things that they can clock. Like if they if they mention, because ageism is a thing, right? Yeah. If they mention your age and say, you look a bit young to be here or something well, along that, those that's lines. A, that's exactly what they said. Stand up, right? That's exactly what they, they The someone person said to me. And, and who's your colleague who was on your side of the wall mm. and say, no, we don't accept that. Well, no one you did. I mean? No one did. The person actually said to me, you don't look old enough to be here. You look like you're 16. Straight out of mm. school. And I was completely thrown because I, like people will tell me that I look young. But people not at work, <laughs> you know, in my personal life or whatever, in the shops or something like that. I've never had it at work where someone's been so explicit and said it so publicly in a room where I was leading a workshop with a room full of 30 odd people or whatever it was. So, yeah, but again, it doesn't come to people's minds as quickly and I think when you're, you know, position that I'm in, D and I lead, but also being black or being part of a minority group or an oppressed group, you just pick up on cues just so much quicker. Like yeah. you're just so much like when I go into an all white space, I'm so aware of my blackness. Yeah. I'm so aware that I'm different and I'm other that anything that's said, I just pick on it straight away. Yeah. But I just don't think that those other white people or whoever it is is in the room is picking up on the fact that I'm the only black person. I, they're not, they're sometimes, I think, so, they, sometimes I, I think if they've seen you, they've picked up you're the only black person, for sure. Maybe, but sometimes I think, so, sometimes I think when you're not an ethnic minority, I think you're, you're not so unaware of colour that, that you don't even see it. No, no, no. They're aware of colour. I don't know, they, you know. They, just some of the comments of I've the heard comments some people tell me, I and mean. And the impact of the comments. I think they're aware of colour. They see you. They're not aware of the words that is is being said by them or somebody else, and the impact of those words, right? They they okay because, fair because it has those impact on those words has no impact on them. Yeah. But because it has no impact on them, they don't feel anything, and they think as long as as long as they didn't say the n word to you, if they said that, they know they they understand the impact of that word because mm. of the historical context of it, right? But just to say something about your hair. It's just like, oh, just a comment about your hair. Yeah, yeah, you're right, actually, you're right. And I guess it comes back down to what we said before about those microaggressions. Because I remember when I was <clears throat> looking for a wedding dress, I remember going into a shop and the woman saying to me, oh, but you're so exotic looking. This is going to look really nice against your skin. Ooh. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> want to leave. <laughs> And I don't know if anyone out there has gone <laughs> wedding shop dressing, <laughs> but to give you a bit of an idea of what it's like, this you walk in. Does it sound creepy? Like this one is so good against your skin. <laughs> You're like, oh, what is she gonna do? Is she gonna peel my skin and sell it on the black market? <laughs> but to give people a bit of an idea of just just to set the scene as of why this was so creepy, um. For those who haven't got a wedding, looking for a wedding dress before, but you walk into the shop, you pick out the dresses that you want, and because these dresses are so, or the big dresses that I was looking at were so big and complicated to get into, one someone from the shop, a shop assistant, actually walks into the fitting room with you and helps you put on the dress. So obviously, if they're going into the room with you, you're not wearing very much, so you kind of are just in your underwear or may even be topless because some of the dresses you know you don't wear a bra for mm -hmm. so the woman's telling me this whilst I'm in my most most vulnerable state in the fitting room in my underwear <laughs> <laughs> where you can already be a little bit self-conscious because some you know, you've got a big mirror of yourself and then also someone else who you've never seen before is seeing you for the first time in your underwear or potentially you know just in your panties so she's telling me this at that moment where I'm wearing very little clothes. <laughs> so it was the strangest, it was the strangest thing ever. And um, 
when we left the room, I mentioned it to my mum and she was like, oh, I knew you was going to... She, we both picked up on it. She was like, I knew you was going <laughs> to say something straight away because it was strange. <laughs> I got many other strange comments said to me when I was getting my wedding dress fitted. I, I got, but I, I won't go more. into that. I got one more. I mean, I once worked for the company for a company and they wanted to move into a new London building. Yeah. And... Um, um, they, 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 they were renting a building that was like too small we were starting to get cramped up on the desk and stuff like that so we moved building into a new one, open plan massive windows covering all sides of the building mm. bright light um, open plan workspace all modern and that right and this was only three years ago or something okay like so that. recent very recently but there was no disabled toilet Oh, now. And wait, wait. By disabled, do you mean uh, wheel wheelchair accessible? Not, not just that. Just even if you had a walking stick or you, you needed assistance to sit down on the toilet, there was no facilities for that. Oh my days! Right. They moved into this building. Not That's poor. once did they think about That's poor. that. Right. Now I noticed this because I don't need that assistance. Right. I'm looking at the toilet facilities. I notice one. There's only one toilet here, and unisex. And... No, one for men, one for women. Oh, okay. And it was quite small, and um, I don't see a disabled one. And I used to work with somebody who like needed a wheelchair and stuff. Oh yeah. And I remember, you know, if you needed assistance, where would you go? And I realised there's nowhere to go here. You couldn't work here if you needed that and they never considered it and that's and and i find that shocking because that's a big company yeah that's not that's not no we're not talking about a 50 man band where they're looking to work in i don't know if we work is is um wheelchair accessible but it's not somewhere like that where you're just kind of renting out a room or anything it's like a proper yeah it's a big organization where things like that should have been thought about yeah so another example of DNI, you know, for all people. I give you an, give you another story as of it as we're going through the story mill <laughs> of, of just different things that happen and how people sometimes don't think. So I was in an office with a col um sorry in, the, in a lift with a colleague, and she was like, oh my gosh, my hair's so greasy, my hair's so greasy. Nicole, what do you think? Do you think my and she's white? She's like, oh Nicole, do you think my hair's greasy? And I was like, um. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. And she was like, oh, but what do you think though? This just like, it looks really greasy. Like, didn't and she's like there putting her hands in her hair and trying to get me to answer. And again, I'm just like, oh, I don't really know. And she's pushing and pushing me, pushing me for an answer. And I had to say her, say to her, listen, we don't have the same hair type. I have absolutely no idea what your greasy hair for a white person looks like <laughs> you need to go and ask someone else and you need to go into the office and ask somebody else who's going to know I said we just and this I, is... I, I'm absolutely no I cannot advise you on this yeah because I genuinely don't know because I don't have your hair type yeah and she <laughs> needs to speak to someone in her own community group who, who knows understands who's her in the know. culture and her background and can and talk yeah. to her about that type of stuff and she kind of laughed off with ha 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 don't be so silly and I was like no I'm being deadly honest I have no idea what <laughs> what greasy hair for a white person looks like so so yeah just another story there um of how of how sometimes things are yes so what can these companies do to to help so we've spoken already about kind of hiring diverse talent um, so again, I'll just reiterate that will be things like, you know, looking at diverse recruitment boards and looking to advertise your jobs there. So go, instead of going for your standard conventional routes that you use at the moment to, to hire individuals, exploring other options and seeing what's out there. And then once you do have that talent walk through the door, really think about what can you do to make them feel included in that co in that company culture. Mm. It's all well and good having, you know, more black people in the company, but if they're just going to stay there for a year and leave because they don't feel included or don't feel like they're getting promoted or the same equal opportunities, then it's just an absolute waste of time. Whenever you hire 
marginalised groups, they need to feel like their voices are heard and that they've got a seat at the table. And I just hear from way too many friends that that is just not the case. That just does not happen. Think about what can you do to elevate these marginalised groups and make sure their voices are heard. And if you have a problem with that, if anyone, you know, if you have a problem with, with oh, why, why do they deserve more attention than others? You really need to sit and really think about why you have that viewpoint and sit back and look at the research and the statistics. Because at the moment, black people are not represented in senior positions in companies. Like they're just not. So special attention needs to be given to them in the same way that special attention is given to trying to hire senior women in this, into senior positions. It's the exact same thing just for black people. But there is a problem with companies and being able to talk properly and have conductive, you know, meaningful conversations about race in the workplace. For some yeah. reason, People workplaces like dodge race so much. If you cannot have, have a, a conversation, conversation about it. If you have a conversation, sometimes an open conversation or something like that with people in the company, people like to blank out. They like to think they're not the problem and um, they don't need to do anything about it. Or, you know, and I'm just talking about your, you know, your colleagues. I'm not even talking about the senior people. I'm just talking about your d- colleagues. Your colleagues, your like peers. That. They like to blank out of the conversation, you know, oh, here we go again and all that stuff. Do you, do you know what book I would highly recommend people to read? It's, probably, it's one that was read, I think it got to the bestseller spot during lockdown. But if you haven't read it, I'd highly, and this is for black people as well, to read Why I'm No Longer Speaking to White People About Race. Mm-hmm. It's such an insightful book, which I'm sure many black people who are listening now could resonate with and identify with but it's so insightful and it's such a good book to be able to you know pick a few bits from it and equip yourself and be able to speak to your white colleagues or friends about it because I think sometimes when we want to speak to our friends about race we don't have the language to use and I think um, this particular book is really really good about you know giving people the tools and, and the language to use um, when having those types of conversations I think there's a few more tips yeah that can be used um so second one is caring about diversity and inclusion all year round so making sure that you know we had the murder of of George Floyd, we had the Black Lives Matter movement protests kind of going around earlier this year. We want to make sure that this is not just something that companies put up a post to say hashtag Black Lives Matter, do a bit of DNI training and that's it. All done, job done, don't do anything more, sit back and relax until the next protest happens. That's not it. We need to be put, applying pressure to the DNA functions to be making sure that they're thinking about this all year round. They're actively making change through policy making, decision making, training, and all of that good stuff, communication, having kind of really open conversation with employees. And then, second, then th- finally, just caring about black employees as well. And I think it's really, really important that, you know, um, companies care about black have a genuine care about black employees and a genuine genuine want to get them up into to, to senior positions and then for us as black people to make sure that we just continue to have these conversations about what it's like how we feel being in all white places what tactics what tools can we use to navigate these spaces navigate these rooms and you know experiences of microaggressions also having those conversations as us as like working in a city black professionals and how we're coping because I think when we have more of those conversations we can learn from each other and get tips and tricks and things like that and the more we learn from each other we're building up a strong community amongst ourselves but we can also bring that back into the workplace as well um 
ultimately the aim is or the one is is for us all to walk into the workplace and bring our authentic selves to work and feel like we don't have to put on you know our 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 work voice or have our you know work persona or whatever it is but the fact of the matter is the way that I am at home and the way that I am at work or the way I'm in my personal life the way that I am at work is two different versions of me it's two different Nicoles yeah and you've seen that like as I'm working from home, Stefan will see the difference as I'm on calls and things like that. And we want to get to a place where things kind of are a bit more, you don't feel like you have to change and, and switch it up. But I think for the time being, that's the way many people feel. So how can we make sure that we make the most of our work persona as possible and leveraging the tips that the community, the black community have to make sure we're making the most of ourselves at, you know, when we bring our work persona into the workplace. We just need to make sure that we are elevating ourselves as much as possible and we're showing people every single day why we deserve to be in those spaces and why we deserve to be in those positions and calling out microaggressions, racism, prejudice, all of that stuff when we see it or or, or having someone in HR or or your manager or whatever that you feel like you can talk to about these things as well. I think that's really good tips. Yeah. I think we're good to wrap it up there then. Yeah, well, we'll we'll just end it there and yeah, we'll catch up with everyone next week. Bye. Bye. If you have any questions or dilemmas, email us on ordinaryblackprofessionals at gmail.com or we can be found on Instagram and Twitter at ordinaryblackprofessionals. Also, don't forget to follow us, subscribe and leave a rating and comment.